serious? Sorry. Oops. Welcome back everyone to our 2022 novel lecture series, the role of turbulence in oceans, atmosphere and climate. It is my pleasure today to introduce our speaker of this year, Professor Rafael Ferrari. As a physical oceanographer, Professor, Professor Ferrari has significantly contributed to our understanding of the climate system with research efforts that span from the fundamental principles of ocean and atmosphere dynamics to the response of these systems to climate change. One example of this is the collaboration of Professor Ferrari's group in the Climate Modeling Aliens, an interdisciplinary project that aims to develop a new earth system model capable of pr providing high accuracy predictions of the changing climate, helping to mitigate its effects and to adapt to future environment. Professor Ferrari's group contributes to the development of the ocean component um, using machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques combined with satellite and ground observations to better represent small scale processes. Today, he will present the lecture Climate Modeling 2.0, Data-Driven Parameterization of Ocean Turbulence. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ferrari once again. Hello, can you hear me? It's the silence meaning that nobody can hear me. Hello? We can hear you in the room. Thanks. Ah, okay, great. Um, I hope you didn't get too dizzy looking at this picture. Uh, the topic of today's lectures is getting into ocean modeling, I call it for the 21st century, but I'm really going to describe a bit the approach we've taken in uh, uh, what Fabiola introduced, the Climate Modeling Alliance. This is a collaborative project between Caltech, JPL, and MIT to, to build what we call the new generation climate model. And I explain what I mean by new generation uh, so that you understand this collaborative project is trying to address all components of the climate system, Caltech, the group at Caltech, led by Tapio Schneider, is really dealing with the, the atmospheric component. At JPL, they are building uh, the land component. At MIT, we are focusing on the ocean component, and then we couple all of them together. The work I present today is mostly focused on the work we are doing at MIT, and you see the numerous people that are involved in this effort. We have a number of undergraduate students, Masha, Uliana, and Adeline, um, have worked with us on some aspects mostly related to application of calibration uh, of parameterization, something that we we'll get into during the talk. We have a few graduate students in the project, Ali and Grace, in particular, working with us. There are um, there is a postdoc, Simone, that just joined the group, and then a few researchers, Greg. Um, Navid, Andre, and Jean-Michel. So it's a large effort because, as you see, it involves many components. And building these models requires different expertises. And maybe it's worth saying that the students and postdocs that we have are from very different disciplines, starting from computer science, mathematics, and physical oceanographers, and physicists. So it's also trying to gather together the kind of expertise that is not often um, available in these collaborative projects that tackle climate models where most of the expertise generally is focused more on the specific discipline of climate science. And I'll try to explain also why is it that we are able to be a bit more inclusive in terms of difference of disciplines. So first we start for what is the question? Why do we even bother about creating a, what we call a new generation climate model? After all, we have plenty of climate models that are run regularly and used, for example, to produce what are called IPCC report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that every seven years or so produces an update on our understanding of the climate system. And I'll show here where the issue might be. This, uh, are projections on the graph that you see from a whole set of uh, climate models run all over the globe by different groups. And all these models are used in the IPCC report, but in particular, these particular runs that I'm showing here are simulations from each one of these models forced by a doubling of CO2 concentration and allowing the model 
or the simulation to come all the way to equilibrium. So the climate comes back to an equilibrium and you are asking how much does the temperature increase because of that doubling of CO2. And you see some of these models, the ones on the left here, predicts the temperature increase of close to six degrees Celsius. Uh, instead, the model is all the way to the right in this panel, we predict no more than, or even a bit less than two degrees C warming. That's a huge difference. We know a two degree warming, it's already problematic for a doubling of CO2, but if you were going to go to a six degrees, that's a very different story. So in a sense, these models are not up to the task of really informing us on what risk are we facing if we know uh, uh, what emissions we are uh, moving towards, or at least what emissions or what is the maximum CO2 levels that we can allow for a particular temperature increase is not something that will be easy to predict or project based on these models. Now, already here in the low axis, I'm trying to suggest that there is some hint of where this uncertainty might be coming from. For example, the models on the right in this panel tend to have more clouds, the model on the left tend to have fewer clouds. We know the cloud feedbacks are quite important in producing the mean temperature of the climate system. And so it seems like small scale processes might have might play a role in this uncertainty. And just to make sure that we're all on the same page here, I'm really talking about the uncertainty associated with the physics or biogeochemistry in the model itself, right? Then there is the additional uncertainty that we don't know how much we are going to emit in the future, meaning the human component. But here I'm saying, even without the uncertainty, the human component, there is a large uncertainty in this projection just associated with structural uncertainty in the model itself. And that's what we want to address. So where do we think the model bias is coming from in this simulation that are all forced in the same way, so they should have given consistent results. And we all know that when we deal with fluid dynamics on a scale like a planet, the, our whole Earth, we can't res uh, resolve the dynamics and uh, the chemistry for that matter and the biology on the kind on all the scales that matter in this problem because of limitation on computer power and said what we have to do we take the whole sphere and we essentially cut it into a grid um, which presently will have a resolution of something of the order of 100 by 100 kilometers um, and it might have 100 vertical levels so we have small cubes and if you think 100 by 100 kilometer grid the uh, for all of Ontario, it would be like it's something like 10 by 10 grid points. You know that there is a lot of physics that happens within those grids. So here I'm showing, for example, in this simple schematic, that if I take a grid point in my climate model and I look at what happens inside, whether there are, for example, a lot of clouds or a lot of vortices in the ocean that I'm not, that the model is not able to resolve, but they might have an important influence on the climate state. Or another way to say it, let us say that phi is some variable, it could be the temperature or the velocity in that grid point. So our climate model is only able to reproduce what is the mean value of that variable, for example, cloud coverage phi, the average for the whole box, or, yeah, for the whole box. Uh, but the evolution of that variable is affected by motions that happen at smaller scales, like, for example, the cloud distribution, the motions in the ocean, the chemistry in that box. So all these fluxes are generally called the divergence of an eddy flux, as we call it. So again, in terms of what we discussed in the last two lectures, turbulent processes can affect the mean variable, but they are not explicitly resolved. So we have to find a way to relate these turbulent fluxes only in terms of large scale variables the model is able to resolve. And that's where we think a lot of that uncertainty is coming because otherwise all these models are pretty accurate in resolving the equation of the scores grid, but they make different choices in the way they represent the small scale physics. And the um, slide that I've shown you before suggests that those different choices end up making a substantial difference in the forward projections. So how do we start? I mean, so our idea is that how do we move forward or what do we propose to change in the way we develop the representation of these small scale fluxes that are not explicitly resolved by the model, but are important to capture. In a sense, it's saying that I have to capture the net effect of clouds or vortices in every grid point of the model without having to resolve all the detailed physics in that model. But the first thing is that we thought that we had to develop a new climate model that could be run 
both on high and low resolution. What I mean by that is that I want a model that can be run on global scales, and we call this new model that is emerging is um, the climate atmos is the name of the atmospheric component. Oceanigans is the name of the ocean component for the moment. We come up with some collective name that we haven't gotten yet because the models are not coupled yet. Um, but what we want is that this model, we want to be able to run it at this coarser resolution on the full planetary scale. This is temperature in the atmosphere, or this would be vorticity in the ocean. But we wanted the same model to be able to run at very high resolution. So for example, we take a small point uh, on the sphere and we want to have the capacity to run a very high resolution uh, simulation that is all clouds at one grid point in the model or at one grid point in the ocean we want to have a model that resolve the turbulence in the upper ocean for example the reason for that is that then we can at the same time try to build a large scale model but we have the capacity to also resolve the small scale process that we don't know about we cannot run the model high resolution everywhere but we are going to have the capacity of at least running high resolutions and use them as i said to improve the skill of the large scale model and how do we do that that's the next step we want to formulate our parameterization and the parameterization is just a representation of the subgrid scale physics that i said is important but we cannot resolve on the course grid of the climate model so we want to formulate new parameterization of the subgrid scale physics that we'll see rely on the architecture that we are building. But the first thing we want to do is that we want the parameterization to be generalizable out of sample. What do we mean? Is that we want to have a model that predicts future climate, something we haven't um, really observed. So we don't have an observed analog, but we want also the model to have what are called sparse parameterization, as few parameters as possible. I guess a good analogy is always uh, how we move from the Ptolemaic system to the Copernicus system to describe the orbit of planets. The Ptolemaic system, when Copernicus uh, proposed this new system, was actually more accurate in predicting planetary orbits than the Copernicus system, but it had many more tunable parameters for the various epicycles. Um, so in a sense, uh, all these parameters were not easily uh, interpretable because it wasn't clear exactly what they described. When Copernicus came around with the heliocentric model of planetary system together with Newton, then there is physics that backs all the parameters entered into that problem. And then it can be, it's a model that can be falsified. So we want to have parameterizations in that sense, they use as few parameters as possible. And these parameters should be interpretable so that we can, essentially it's a physics-based parameterization and those parameters since are really representing some physical process, they are related to observable physical processes, can be tuned against, um, we'll see, a combination of high resolution simulation and observations, which is the next step. Because if the model is has a small as possible set of three parameters and these parameters are interpretable, what we mean is that if I run a high resolution simulation of the process, I should be able to tune those parameters based on the observation I have to predict for example, the net effect of clouds. I can also use observation in the present day climate to represent those physical variables. I think that's quite important. That there is a very good reason why we do physics the way we do it. We believe the physical law apply in the present as much as in the future. So as long as we rely on physics, we understand and we can calibrate, we have hope that whatever parameterization we are using is still applying in a, a different climate state. If instead we take a brute force approach where we just try to tune a model that cannot be easily connected to laws of physics, but just it's a numerica or a, like an AI, but we could call it a machine learning algorithm that just reproduces the data that we have for today. But we've done an interpolation exercise. It's not clear how that, well, that same algorithm will predict a system that we haven't observed because interpolation generally doesn't guarantee extrapolation into a different climate so it's not necessarily the right way to go so as i said we create parameterization they are generalizable they are interpretable we can calibrate them we don't stop just the calibration finding the optimal set of parameters that reproduce the observation and high resolution simulation that we can run we also want to quantify the uncertainty in those parameters 
And we can do that with Bayesian approaches that I described. So for every parameter, we also have an uncertainty. The reason why that is very important is that then we can use the uncertainty in all of these parameters and propagate it through the full climate model to see how much the uncertainty in our parameterizations, they are called parameterization for a reason, right? They are not exact solutions. So there is uncertainty inherent in the way we represent the physics. But if we know the uncertainty, then we can project the uncertainty in our projection. And that's going to be very different from the model ensemble I've shown you so far, where we were running different models and they give different results, but we don't quite know the reasons. And in a sense, that graph that I've shown you is more of an admission of ignorance. We just don't know how the climate might evolve in this state. It's not a quantification of uncertainty because we don't know whether certain models have made the reasonable choices or not. If we had uncertainty in all the parameters, instead we can propagate that uncertainty and say, for example, that the increase in temperature for a W of CO2, often called the climate sensitivity, well, could be three degrees plus or minus. 1.5 degrees or whatever it's going to be in the simulations because we had the uncertainty that is at least contributed by the, the inaccurate or imperfect representation of the subgrid scale physics. So uh, in particular today, what I want to describe is how we are taking this approach to represent one of the key processes, subgrid scale processes that uh, affect the ocean mean state. And in particular, I'm going to talk about parameterization of the ocean boundary layer turbulence in the ocean. This is one of the processes. The other one in the ocean that is particularly relevant is going to be geostrophic turbulence, but we talked about that yesterday, so I didn't want to repeat that story. So let's see, uh, first of all, what I mean by boundary layer uh, in the ocean. This is a section, it's observation from the real ocean. It's a section that um, actually I was involved in taking. Um, it's halfway between the California coast and Hawaii, between 25 and 35 degrees north. This is depth from the surface to 300 meters, so we're looking close to the ocean surface. And I'm showing density, the density of the fluid. You see that below this black line, the density is increasing very rapidly with that. You get light fluid over dense fluid, and the density is changing quite fast. But above that black line, the density in the vertical is changing very little. We call this depth down to the black line, the mixed layer, or it's the boundary layer of the ocean, it's mixed because there is enough turbulence driven by surface winds or cooling at the surface or evaporation. And this turbulence keeps churning and mixing the water in this upper layer and maintaining it pretty well mixed. So what we want to represent is the physics that maintains this boundary layer well mixed. This boundary layer changes seasonally quite rapidly. So here I'm showing as a function of time uh, uh, from a, a collection of observations of uh, the upper ocean. And we're showing over a repeated year what is the typical boundary layer depth or mixed layer depth. And what you see is that in winter, so this, when you see this red colors, this is the winter in the Southern hemisphere. Um, you see the boundary layer gets down to excess of 400 meters, but then as soon as you get into the summer, and um, the boundary layer instead retreats to order of a few tens of meters. The same is true in the North Atlantic. When you get into the North Atlantic winter, the boundary layer comes very deep. So it's a very dynamic system. It's not just a constant depth. And so we want to capture its evolution over time. How do models do today in representing this boundary layer depth? And here and now I'm showing just a snapshot. Well, a estimate of uh, the boundary layer depth. Now it's from Argo floats. These are floats that profile the ocean in the vertical. They are freely flow, floating. Uh, they take a profile every 10 days, and then they are parked for 10 days uh, at the depth of 1,000 or 2,000 meters, depending on the particular float. And then they come to the surface, take a profile, transmit their data to satellite, and sink back. So we have continuous observation albeit sparse, but continuous uh, over, for example, the whole Southern Ocean in winter. So this is Antarctica. And we look at the boundary layer depth that here is in excess of 400 meters deep, as I said before, in winter. And then as we come in the fall, well, end of spring, um, do I mean that? No, sorry. Uh, end of summer or beginning of fall when the boundary layer is at its minimum, um, then the boundary layer depth is just a few tens of meters. Below, I showed the difference between 
the boundary layer depth predicted by CSN, a community climate model is run at NCAR. Mine, uh, and so it's the difference between the model projection for the present climate and what we actually know from observations. We see in winter, the model in this band where we had the deepest mixed layer, it's close to 300 meters too shallow. So it's strongly biased. It doesn't mix as deep as the observation would suggest. In some sector, like here, you might say, well, but the model is also predicting a mixed layer that is too deep north of the uh, region, and maybe it's just an offset in the latitude um, where the boundary layer exists. But then you have sectors like this where the bias on this side is not as large as that. So really, there are issues about how deep uh, their parameterization of this boundary layer physics uh, can mix, and there are strong biases. This is a particular model, but it turns out that actually this result and this particular bias, I call it a smiley face because it has a bit of sense of a smiley face when projected from Antarctica, uh, is seen in most climate models. So it's a serious bias that seems to be pervasive in the way we represent the subgrid scale physics because it appears in most climate models that are run today. So should you care about it? Because then the next thing is, you know, there are processes, I mean, the model, the climate model will never be perfect, but there might be processes that are a bit irrelevant from the climate questions that we ask. Uh, so the next thing you want to do is that you want to start at least addressing the parameterization of processes that are leading order in setting the climate system, in this case, from the ocean side. So to make a case of why this mixed layer plays an important role, or its depth in particular, we can write a simple, uh, heat budget for uh, the full ocean. This is a model uh, inspired by Goffrey. And uh, what I'm going to do is I assume the ocean is composed again of two simple layers. One is the mixed layer and the other one is the whole rest of the deep ocean. So first we write the heat budget for this upper mixed layer layer. The change in temperature of this layer multiplied by its thickness. So I assume that the model is well mixed in temperature here, multiplied by the density of seawater and the heat capacity of this water. So that's the rate of change of the heat content of this layer. Well, it's going to be given by the incoming radiation or the incoming heat flux that is coming from the atmosphere minus the outgoing flux out of the boundary layer. So this is heat coming in and heat coming out. And then there is an exchange of heat with the layer below. For simplicity, I mean, we showed that we showed that this layer is actually a set of many layers, but for simplicity, now we assume that it's just a deep layer with uniform temperature to make the point. So when we are saying what is the exchange of heat with the base of through the base of the boundary layer, well, that is going to be proportional to the change in, to the difference in temperature between these two layers multiplied by mu, which is some rate of exchange, which will depend on the ocean circulation and other processes. So now we have a budget a heat budget for the upper layer. And then we can write the heat budget for the lower, lower layer, the deep ocean, which is again the change in temperature of the deep ocean times the depth, the much larger depth. So this is going to be order of four kilometers of the deep ocean times the water density times the heat capacity of the lower layer. This lower layer is only exchanging heat with the upper layer, so it's only source of heat is exchanged with the upper layer. So now we have this simple two equation systems. And uh, as you can see in the two equation system, the big difference is already that there is a rate of change of temperature by multiplied by a very small h here, small depends high in terms of human heights, but it's order of a few hundred meters at most, while capital H, the depth of the lower layer, is order of uh, um, four kilometers. So in a sense, this terms has much larger thermal inertia than the upper layer, just because it takes a long time to heat that water. So what you can show in this simple model is that if I put a perturbation in F, in the incoming uh, heating entering into the ocean, at the beginning, the only response that you see is in the upper ocean. The lower ocean hardly responds to that change in temperature because it has this very large inertia. So essentially for a while, Yes, there is a tiny bit of heat coming in, but it hardly affects the result. So what is the time scale over which the upper ocean or the mixed layer responds? Well, you can just look at what is the time scale of the response of the system is set by, well, just density of seawater, heat capacity of seawater, this heat loss and the exchange rate with the interior, but in particular is proportional to the depth of that boundary layer. 
And you can show that for reasonable choices of this parameter based on atmospheric and ocean physics, that you get that the response is of order of one year for a boundary layer of 20 meters. If your boundary layer starts becoming 100 meters, then it's going to be 10 years. And if you go 400 meters, you see that this case linearly. So it's from ERV to decadal time scale is the fast time response due to the boundary layer depth. Instead, the time scale of the response of the deeper ocean depends on this capital edge, the much deeper depth of the ocean, and that is of the thousands of years. So it takes a long time to warm or cool the deep ocean in response to surface perturbation. So what the point I'm trying to make here is that you see that the depth of this boundary layer is essentially setting the rate at which um, the surface temperature of the ocean is responding, and that strongly affects on nearly time scale and decadal time scale, what is the temperature that the atmosphere is feeding? So it's the surface temperature that we are living with uh, in the lower atmosphere. And so it affects climate projection decadal time scales. And that's why we need to properly represent the physics that sets that age. So what is the approach we're going to take? This point can probably guess, or at least what I'm going to present today in particular is that what we're going to do is that we're going to have high resolution simulations of the process that happen in the upper ocean. We call this large eddy simulation, the way they're called. So we resolve most of the physics we care about in this boundary layer turbulence, but we can run such models only on one grid point of the large scale model. We can't run it globally at that resolution because it would just be too computationally expensive, but locally we can. When you're talking about ocean physics, it turns out that we are in a pretty good shape in the sense that what determines the dynamics of this boundary layer, it's really physics and thermodynamics. And we both know we can fully resolve the physics. We know it's regulated by the Navier-Stokes equations. And the thermodynamics is largely set by the equation of state of seawater that we understand and we have good models for. So the real problem that we have in representing this small scale physics is just a lack of resolution. But if we have enough resolution, these models are quite credible. So we can create data for what that turbulence look like in various points of the large scale model. So the first thing would be to run this high resolution simulation and create a library that we can use as a training data set to learn about the parameterization. Then to discuss how we develop and calibrate a boundary layer parameterization based on these high resolution simulations. And then we'll use the point that then, then I won't get probably to that today, but then we are going to use this calibrate parameterization. We put it back in the large scale climate model and then we use it to um, run model solutions like the one I shown you before of the global ocean, the Portisti was already using a boundary layer parameterization. So the way we start is that, as I said, we have created this model of the ocean oceanamigans that can be run at very high resolution simulation. So we're going to look at solutions that have 500 by 500 meter it's a small box, it could be a kilometer by a kilometer. And so it's even less than a grid point in the global model. And we're just going to use this code is written in Julia. So it can run, uh, it's a new um, coding language that makes it very easy to run the same model on GPUs or CPUs. The GPU is very useful for simulation like that because they are very efficient and fast um, processing tools, which is what we need. Um, one of the problems of traditional languages would be that when you transition to different architecture, you have to rewrite, rewrite large parts of the code. So while with Julia, we can avoid that problem. It's the same code that runs without any, any change, essentially, except the line in the code to say what architecture you want to use. And then the compiler deals with uh, addressing the specifics of the architecture. And the particular problem I want to look at today, just to keep the problem simple, let's consider boundary layer turbulence generated by loss of heat at the ocean surface. So you're cooling the ocean. So it's like in the problem I've shown you before, we are at the end of summer and we enter in fall and all of a sudden we start having cooling, loss of heat from the ocean to the atmosphere. And um, the way the, mo what the model solves are just the Navier-Stokes equations that are right here and the temperature equation for the moment. It should be buoyancy, but we are only forcing heat. So we can just think in terms of temperature just to keep the problem simple. Conservation of mass. And our top boundary condition for this simulation that resolves the full physics um, is just that there is a heat flux imposed, a negative heat flux that is loss of heat from the surface. And 
if I let the model evolve, what you see is that the model starter, maybe I should have said this. The model start at the beginning with a linear density stratification. What I mean is temperature is increasing, temperature is decreasing linearly with depth. So at the moment, the model was very stratified. It's like at the end of summer. And then we start applying a cooling. And here you're seeing a plot of vertical velocity. And you see this strong turbulence that develop at the top of my boundary layer. We are entering in wind in fall, then through winter here. And you see the boundary layer is getting deeper over time. And now I resolve all this turbulent physics that is churning the upper ocean in response to what is called upright convection. Um, from the point of view of the climate model, as we said, I don't want to resolve all this physics and all these turbulence that I see in this simulation, right? I just want to solve, in particular, the area average, the evolution of the area average temperature, and which includes, you know, the area average temperature means that I'm going to include how deep is this boundary layer over which depth the mean temperature is uniform. So what we want is to predict the average temperature theta bar when I take the theta from the high resolution simulation and I average in x and y over that whole domain. And I want to write an equation for the evolution of this mean temperature because the model, the large scale model, is not going to resolve all the detailed physics. And when I take the average of this equation, there are these turbulent fluxes in particular since I took as on an area average of the problem. There is only a vertical divergence of turbulent fluxes that matter, it's just how I mix in the vertical. Or if you want, you can see it here what I mean. This on the right is the evolution of the temperature as a function of depth from this model here. And you see the mean temperature that is getting deeper and deeper. It's sinking. This is the boundary layer that is being formed. And it's just the temperature average over the whole domain as a function of time. I want to reproduce the evolution of this mean temperature. And here I show two of the turbulence statistics that um, are inducing that mixing, but that we want to represent that we cannot resolve in the uh, large scale model in the climate model. This is the turbulent kinetic energy. And even more importantly here is the turbulent flux. How fast you mix in the vertical is dictated by this vertical mixing rate. Vertical just because if I average everything in the horizontal, it's the only direction left. Uh, it turns out that the hardest part in this problem is not to mix, to represent where the depth over which you're well mixed. It's really at the base of the boundary layer. The point is that as I cool, I create very cold plumes of water that sinks towards the base of the boundary layer. But since these water parcels are cold, they accelerate towards the bottom and they tend to overshoot a bit through the base of the boundary layer. So they're cold plumes. They don't just sit, stop at their neutrally buoyant level when they get as cold as their neighbors. They overshoot a bit. And so there is what is called entrainment at the base of the boundary layer. And that's the hard part to capture. And we contend that a lot of the biases we've seen in this large scale model is that the entrainment is not properly captured and therefore you miss the fact that the boundary layer can accurately deepen much faster than you think because it keeps entraining extra fluid from the base and accelerating its deepening. In the interest of time, uh, I'm not going to discuss much the calibration of an existing parameterization. The, the main point here is that most of the models that I've described so far use something that's called the CAP KPP vertical profile parameterization. It's a parameterization that uh, we've shown uh, what is interesting in this parameterization, maybe that's the only thing I need to say, is that represents the evolution of temperatures in a grid point of the model in terms of a diffusion equation in the vertical. And it depends on a set of parameters, of arbitrary parameters that need to be tuned. And what we showed in this first part of the work, because we want to understand whether we could use and better calibrate this parameterization, is that there is a fundamental failure in this parameterization when we train it against observation. We show that for no choice of the parameters, the arbitrary parameters of so the non-dimensional parameters that appear in the closure, for no choice of those parameters, you can represent physics on every possible condition. So the parameterization can be tuned to represent, for example, mixing in heat flux for weak stratification for small surface heat flux and weak stratification. But then that set parameter will not work when you have strong cooling or much stronger stratification. That tells you that it's the formulation of the parameterization is deficient and you cannot calibrate it to produce accurate results. So we just step forward. And instead, I want to show you how we formulate a new parameterization, how we calibrate it so that we can actually reproduce a whole set of different solutions, meaning that it's this parameterization can be calibrated accurately for all kinds of surface heat fluxes and stratifications. Uh, 
We call this parameterization convective adjustment turbulent kinetic energy equation. Again, the starting point is similar to the KPP formulation. We said that the rate of change of temperature, capital T is the temperature in the, in the large scale model, while I always call theta bar with the average as the average of the temperature from a high resolution simulation, just to keep them separate. So this is the temperature in a large scale model. And we want to represent the subgrid scale physics, the W prime theta prime, in terms of just the diffusion equation, because you are mixing in the vertex. And this diffusivity kappa, much like yesterday, is expressed in terms of a mixing length scale and a RMS velocity, we want the square root of the epikinetic energy. And so now you need models for both of these components, for this physics that represents uh, how deep you mix. There is a turbulent kinetic energy equation that had the transport term, buoyancy, flux dissipation, it doesn't matter what they are, but there is an equation that step forward the evolution of the kinetic energy, and it depends on some arbitrary, well, arbitrary, non-dimensional parameters that need to be calibrated. The mixing length scale itself um, uh, is expressed in terms of eddy kinetic energy and surface heat fluxes in this case. When the temperature gradient is negative, there is one formulation. And when the temperature gradient is positive, there is a different formulation of the mixing length scale. Now I'm pointing this out because the first part of the choice of L is due to the fact that you're mixing in this boundary layer and where the stratification is, is either zero or very weak. But then there is the second component that says, what happens when you're trying to overmix a bit through the base of the boundary layer where there is some stratification? So this is the part that is crucial to capture what I was called this entrainment layer, where the fluid makes a bit more than you would expect, um, just because it entrains or the plumes end up sinking a bit to be these cold plumes and entraining some of the deeper fluid. So now we have a parameterization. It doesn't matter. It's a diffusive parameterization where my kappa depends on a set of dimensional parameters that are resolved, that have a prognostic equation or that are resolved by the models like the mean temperature. But then there are a set of non-dimensional parameters so right here that really the problem you have is that this diffusion equation is some functional form that depends on Q and a whole set of non-dimensional parameters. These are the ones that we would like to tune to see whether we can make a choice of non-dimensional parameters that allow us to make our simulation or our model or our climate model at one grid point to predict the deepening of the boundary layer exactly equal to what was uh, the evolution or well exactly equal, it's an overstatement as close as possible to what was predicted by a high resolution simulation that results in full scale physics the way we're going to choose the parameter is an optimization problem and so we are going to define a loss function, which is the difference between our temperature in the, in the climate model minus the temperature average over one over the full LES simulation, one grid point of the climate model, right? So we have our closure, we have a set of non-dimensional parameter. And the idea is that if we choose a very good set of non-dimensional parameter, probably these two variables track each other very well. And so this loss function is very small. If the choice of parameter is very bad, uh, is very inaccurate, then this difference would be much larger and our cost fun or our loss function would be very large. So now, how do we find these optimal parameters? We use a Bayesian approach in the sense we have a prior choice of parameters, so it's just a set of values um, that we try to choose um, with some intuition about the physics. But then what we do is that we run a simulation and we see how large this loss function is. If the loss function, um, is very large. We try to choose a new set of parameters that tries to reduce that um, heat function. There is a likelihood parameter. So we try to run a new simulation. This just by new simulation, what I really mean is I solve again this diffusion equation for a new set of parameters that determine the value of kappa t. Those, so it's just a one dimensional uh, diffusion problem run for the whole period of the LES simulation. And I try to see whether I can improve the difference and so what you're really doing here is you're doing a random walk in this parameter space so this would be two i'm just showing two um, parameters that enter in the parameterization of course the model has 13 free parameters so it's a multi-dimensional space and what you do every time you update um, you try to guess a new set of parameters and you see whether the new set of parameters has decreased the, the 
loss function or increase it. You have some thresholds that if this new set of parameters has decreased a lot the string function, you accept it. If um, they have instead increased too much the loss function, you reject them. And so you start seeing that what you do is a bit of a random walk in this parameter space of parameters where you're trying to see, you keep exploring it and you try to see how you get closer and closer to the minimum value um, of the difference in your loss function. That's the set of parameters that supposedly is better capturing the uh, evolution of the LES solution of this uh, very high resolution simulation. But as you go and move around, as you've seen, you're not just moving towards the minimum, you're also exploring essentially the whole PDF of uh, your parameter values. In the sense, you also get some sense of the uncertainty associated with the parameters, because you see that when you were here, you're pretty close to the minimum. So this is a pretty likely value. While when you were up here, you were very far away and you didn't spend much time there because you were clearly very far from the minimum value. So we get a PDF in particular for these two parameters that tells us that these two parameters seems to be related to each other because there is a simple functional form that relate one to the other. So we get the uncertainty, but also potentially correlation across parameter that generally allows you to eliminate one parameter because you can probably express this parameter as a function of this other one. Um, maybe just to point out the algorithm that I described to find the minimum value of the minimum set of parameters is generally called uh, a metropolis algorithm. It's, uh, Marco Chen, Monte Carlo method. So you just keep running the simulation, exploring the whole parameter space very blindly. It turns out that this approach is very expensive. If you have just a few parameters, exploring the parameter space is not too bad. But if you start having a large number of parameters, like our, our 13 parameters, it starts becoming quite expensive. And so instead, we use ensemble Kalman inversion approach where you run a whole set of particles, also a whole set of trajectory at one time. So every time you don't just set one set of uh, uh, parameters C, but you choose a few set of parameters C. And you run simulation for all of them, and you see which one are uh, selected versus which ones are rejected. But by using now all the whole set of parameters, you essentially can approximate a bit uh, the whole shape of your loss function. And so by using this collective information, you try to accelerate the convergence towards the minimum. And these models are quite efficient. It turns out that they work pretty well for the problems at hand. And so now I'm showing you, for example, this uh, is uh, in the upper row is uh, I'm showing in with the shaded red is this evolution of the mean temperature as a function of depth. Uh, from the LES solution. So I'm running the full LES, I take the zonal average, and this is in a sense, it's our truth, what we'd like to be able to reproduce. The dark line is instead a solution of uh, the parameterization equation, like this vection with this diffusion equation where kappa t is using the um, full parameterization. And we calibrated the parameter. So you see that the black, the dark red line tracks very well the shaded curve, meaning that for a whole set of different set of parameters. So this solution starts with different stratification and they use different heat fluxes in some of those. It's something I haven't discussed at all, but we do as well. We're also applying a, a wind stress at the surface. So we also have a, a change in velocity fields. So here in the lower line, I'm showing uh, in the lower half of the panel, I'm showing in blue, the U velocity field and in green, the V velocity field. So if there is a wind stress, the velocity changes as well. And we are showing that also the mean velocity is captured, not just the mean temperature evolution, but also the mean velocity average over the whole box. The parameterization, which is the thin line, cap follows very well for all this set of different forcing function and different initial condition. It follows very well the area average solution of uh, the uh, obtained from the full LES model that was resolved in the full physics. As I said, we can obtain not just the optimal set of parameters, so now these are the whole set of parameters that enter in our parameterization, um, but we can also get an uncertainty on their value. So here we're also predicting uncertainty, and there are some parameters whose uncertainty is pretty limited, so we know them reasonably well. This is one that depends on the richness of number. Um, and indeed, the uncertainty is not too large, but for some other parameters, 
uh, let's see this one for example i don't know exactly what it is but the uncertainty is much larger so this is a parameter that we contribute a lot to uncertainty and at some point you can decide whether it even makes sense to have this parameter in the parameterization because it might not be very useful i'm actually showing you two pdfs if you have looked one is in yellow and the other is in blue um, what is important here is that we are using both the approach that I told you, where we really approximate, keep running our parameterization and try to reduce the loss function. But even that approach can be uh, quite computationally expensive. So in some cases, we have just run an emulator. So the blue line was obtained by uh, run, sorry, the yellow line is the yellow PDFs for each parameter is obtained by running the full. Uh, parameterization but then we can also create an emulator of the parameterization which is much faster than uh, which is just a low mode projection of the parameterization and we can do the parameter estimation on that low mode so just showing that we can really accelerate the param the calibration of the parameterization and the quantification of the uncertainty quite dramatically so that's one way in which we can calibrate the parameterization. Now we have a parameterization for boundary layer turbulence that we shown has skill in reproducing the high resolution physics and it seems to be on track uh, and we also have the uncertainty in the parameterization so that when we put it in the global model then we can use that uncertainty information to estimate the projection of uncertainty on the overall impact of that uncertainty in the full climate model a second approach we've taken and i'd be very quick is instead uh, relies more direct on machine learning approaches but i want to describe how we think one should approach uh, machine learning and this work is really well done by um, a student in the group Ali Ramana, uh, Ramadan with um, John Marshall, who is one of the co PIs in the Modeling Alliance project. The way the project, the approach is taken here is that again, we want to write the temperature equation. And we say, well, what, what about if we just write a diffusion equation on the right hand side as we've done but now we make the kappa t the closure of kappa t incredibly crude we say that when the gradient of temperature is negative so or zero right, right up here where there is convection the diffusivity is very large if the temperature gradient is positive just below the boundary layer it's zero this parameterization by itself is completely missing the fact that uh, there is this entrainment or overshooting of the boundary layer right so we know that uh, the boundary layer parameterization is a bit deficient in that sense. Um, but then we can correct uh, our neural, we can correct this parameterization with the neural network. We say, well, the neural network will just learn to capture this entrainment through the base of the boundary layer, because this is the only part of the parameterization is not capturing. And uh, what is important is again we are training the neural network using a loss function i think this is a subtle point but it's incredibly important i think for anybody who wants to use neural network in uh, um, for parameterization uh, for climate purposes is that our loss function depends on a mean climate variable in this case the mean temperature over the box it would be a mistake to try to train the parameterization against the turbulent fluxes that appear here what is the difference is that here i'm training against a very smooth function um, and therefore the neural network is only trying to capture whatever is necessary from the turbulent fluxes to, re to uh, reproduce the results of the uh, large eddy simulation the high resolution simulation if i try to learn directly the turbulent flux in the tendency term the temperature is changing, what is the term on the right hand side, which is what we generally do in parameterization approaches. Uh, now you're going to get a very noisy function and machine learning neural network will try to learn all the details of that turbulent flux, which is generally fluctuating very rapidly, especially in time. And generally that approach leads to a very unstable parameterization. But if you tune your calibration on the mean variable that are relevant for the climate state, the calibration is much more stable you also have an advantage that when you try to parameterize more than one um, process at the same time what you care about is again is what is their net effect on the overall turbulence and um, not um, sorry um, we are interested in capturing the net effect of all the parameterization on the mean climate variable. And sometimes this parameterization might interact with each other. 
So we don't want, if we tune the parameters independently on each one of the subgrid scale processes, then we are not capturing the interaction. While in this way, by tuning on the mean variables, we are guaranteed to capture their interactions. So we do this calibration, and now I'm showing you on the left-hand side uh, the evolution of the boundary layer after some time, after a few days from the initial, just a few days from the initial parameterization. I think you see in the yellow line is the parameterization without the neural network. So if we just forget about entrainment, you see the boundary layer, it's a bit too shallow compared to the through the LES solution, this blue line. However, when we add this trained neural network, we can reproduce quite accurately the evolution of the boundary layer. This is just the loss function. Indeed, the loss function has decreased dramatically to what you could do with just pure convective adjustment. And maybe I can show you to you here what the point is trying to make the same point I just made before. Indeed, we can tune the parameterization to follow very closely um, uh, the evolution of the boundary layer depth as given by the LES solution. These are just a few days. So difference between the curves may seem small, but if you integrate for a full season, these differences become very large. So I show you here that again, this is the same figure I've shown you before, but as a function of time, the temperature is the temperature profile as a function of depth from the parameterization follows very well the average solution from the LES. But on the left hand side of the panel, instead I'm showing the turbulent fluxes. And you might want to see from the beginning that when it comes to the turbulent fluxes, the turbulent fluxes, the W prime theta prime, the flux that appears on the right hand side of the equation, I can estimate from the LES solution is this blue line. The neural network doesn't necessarily always capture very well the turbulent fluxes. But what it suggests, and what this suggests is that even if I don't capture very well the turbulent flux, I still get a very good representation of the mean. So that difference is apparently dynamically relevant because once I take the average over time, apparently it doesn't affect much the solution. That's why I wanted to train on this variable. If I had tried to train on the turbulent flux to represent the turbulent flux, the right hand side of the equation directly, I would have had all this noise to deal with. In fact, the turbulent flux is kept changing. And it turns out that this closure is very stable, but tuning on this turbulent flux, which we tried at the beginning, is that leads to very unstable parameterizations. And so today, I think I managed to finish nearly in time. I think what the point I try to make is that in order to what we mean by a new generation climate model, the first step is to generate, you know, write a code, and we call in particular the ocean component, oceananigans.jl, is a fast, friendly, and flexible, fun global model that can run on modern architecture. We want something that is very easy to interact with. Climate models are generally not written, at least in my experience, that way. They're not that accessible. You want people to be able to download. If oceananigans.jl is on GitHub, you can go there. And once you install Julia on your laptop, I can guarantee you, you can run it uh, very quickly and start playing a bit with uh, ocean simulations without knowing anything really about the details of the model or uh, how to compile or how to uh, run on GPUs, for example. Everything is pretty uh, seamless. The next step was to write parameterization for subgrid scale physics that can be trained for the moment. I've shown you only high resolution simulations um, to reduce the climate model biases. Why did I show you only res uh, high res training against high resolution simulation? It's because once we train this parameterization and we run it on a global model, now we have our parameters in the parameterization that have some optimal value, but also have an uncertainty. And now what we are doing, we use global observations, and this is something we just started doing. We want to use global observations, and these global observations then can be used to reduce, uh, to change the parameter within the range of uncertainty, uh, to now calibrate also based on available observations. This is very different from what is done today, because once we know the uncertainty of the parameter, we cannot move the parameter away from their uncertainty, because otherwise we know we are betraying the fundamental physics captured by those parameters. Right now, very often what we do in the climate modeling community is that we tune parameters already directly on the large scale uh, observations, and therefore we allow ourselves sometimes to move the parameters, the optimal parameters outside the range of what the physics would suggest they should be. And so at that point, the model is physically not quite defensible anymore. Uh, one important point is that the training of the parameterization is formulated as a gradient free inverse problem. As I told you, we use this ensemble Kalman inversion, so we don't have to compute derivatives of the model to use like that. 
optimal descent or use derivatives to converge a fast towards a minimum. And in Julia, actually, the model is differentiable, but we think that that's a limitation if you take that kind of approach, because sometimes parameterization are hard to differentiate, but more in general, we want the tools that we use to be accessible, not just to the model that we are writing, but also to other models that people want to run. And typically, it's not that easy to write the adjoint of the model. We don't want to put that burden on the developers. And so as I mentioned, as I mentioned, the source code and data are all available. So you can go on Klima, klimapost.jl and klima-oceanenegas.jl on GitHub. We also have the ensemble common process, the approach that you can take uh, to calibrate parameterizations uh, and in particular for the calibration of boundary layer parameterization in the atmosphere EMF and parameterization for, param for the parameterization for processing in the ocean is called parameters estimation. All this software is freely available and we'd be happy if people start, uh, well, I don't know if playing is the right word, but definitely developing these ideas with us. Thank you very much and I'm ready for questions.